Good afternoon. Thank you for attending uh, our webinar on due diligence tips and traps uh, regarding the new final CBD rule. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to provide practical information that will assist with compliance with the new CBD rules. This is an important topic. It will also be covered at the FIBA annual AML conference that will take place in March. And for more information on the AML conference, uh, you can log into www.fibaaml.fiba.net. Uh, I am Daniela Fonseca Pugina. I'm a partner at Baker McKenzie's North America Litigation and Government Enforcement Group. I'm based in Miami, and my practice focuses on resolving disputes in regulatory enforcement matters and internal investigations for financial institutions. We have in our panel Luigi Devani. He is the co-chair of the Global Compliance and Investigations Practice and chair of the North America Government Enforcement Practice at Baker McKenzie. He's based in New York. He was an assistant United States attorney in the District of New Jersey, where he was a member of the Securities Fraud Unit and served as the lead criminal tax prosecutor in the District of New Jersey and headed the Money Laundry Tax Force. He has significant experience in leading trials, cross-border investigations, and defending corporate and individual clients on cross-border and domestic criminal proceedings assisting clients with corporate compliance, especially in the anti-corruption area. Jonathan Adams is Global Compliance Practice Group's Regional Coordinator for Latin America, Baker McKenzie. He heads Baker McKenzie's compliance team in Mexico. He has extensive experience in cross-border compliance issues involving the US, Central, and Latin America. He's admitted to practice in Mexico and uh, the US. John Cunningham, he's a partner in the North America Litigation Government Enforcement Practice Group as well. He's based in Washington, D.C. He was a senior trial attorney with the Department of Justice, where he investigated and prosecuted criminal and employment law matters. He worked as an investigative analyst for the criminal division of the FBI. And with the FBI, he prepared fraud, money laundry, and forfeiture matters for consideration by the Department of Justice. His current practice includes white collar criminal defense and investigations and compliance relating to money laundering, corruption, fraud, acquisitions due diligence, risk assessment, asset forfeiture, and attorney client privilege. With that, I'm going to turn to John and ask him to provide us with an overview of the new CDD rule and the specific changes that it brought to the existing rule. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, what a pleasure to be here for all of us. Uh, my name, as Danny said, is John Cunningham. I am at a Baker and McKenzie's Washington, D.C. office, and it's a great opportunity to be here today to talk to you all about the new client due diligence rule and also provide some reassurances around the rule. And so what we'll do to start off here is sort of run through the basic components of the new rule, and then um, uh, we'll get to a hypothetical later on in the presentation where we'll have the opportunity to answer questions. And by the way, that goes for during the course of the webinar, we're happy to answer any questions that may come up as we're talking generally about the rule. So um, let's just go by way of background. In May 2016, as all of you know, FinCEN issued a final rule on customer due diligence, what we call CDD. These are requirements for financial institutions. <clears throat> and as you know, many of you know, they are um, promulgated pursuant to the Bank Secrecy Act. The new, new rule requires covered financial institutions, which many of you, of course, will work for and are working for, to identify and verify the, identif the identity of beneficial owners of all legal entity customers. Importantly, the second core component of this is that it adds client due diligence as a fifth pillar to the traditional four pillars that we all know so well in terms of creating, designing, and implementing an effective AML program. So now, timing, we get a lot of questions about timing. Covered financial institutions have until May 11th, 2018 to actually implement the necessary components. Not a lot of time left on that. It's two years, actually, from the time that the, the, the rule was uh, officially put out by FinCEN in 2016. So there's been some time between then and now, but of course, now it's getting close. And so there's a lot of work to do for many of us in a short amount of time. But we have until May 11th, 2018. Covered financial institutions, just to be clear, include federal regulated banks, federally insured credit unions, mutual funds, brokers or dealers in securities, 
futures commission merchants and brokers in commodities. So all of those groups are considered part of this body of financial institutions that will be required going forward to implement a client due diligence program as part of their five pillars of their program. So the next slide, the key elements of customer due diligence. And I think this is where we can provide some reassurances. And even FinCEN itself and a lot of the folks involved in getting this rule up and running have said uh, publicly that many of these types of um, requirements are already being covered and are already part of your current programs. So the good news here is some of this is just memorialization of your already strong AML programs. There are, however, a couple twists here, and we'll try to focus on that as we go through the key elements. But they've broken it down, FinCEN has broken it down into four areas. So you've got the first area being customer identification and verification, and we'll flush that out a little bit in a few minutes. Then beneficial ownership identification and verification, and of course, beneficial ownership is one of the key tenets of the new customer due diligence rule. The third component is understanding the nature and purpose of customer relationships to develop a risk profile. And that's important and actually segues well into the fourth component, which is the conduct of ongoing monitoring to identify and report suspicious transactions on a risk basis, and then maintaining and updating customer information. Now, of all of the four of those key components, it's that fourth one that I think many clients and many in the financial in institution industry are the most concerned about because it's newest in terms of what exactly should we be doing in order to make sure that we're doing all the necessary checks and balances with respect to beneficial ownership and the new requirements of the CBD rule. So next slide. Let's talk a little bit about customer identification and verification. So what are our legal entity customers? Corporations, limited liability companies, general partnerships, and similar entities. We get a lot of questions about trust, however, so we wanted to include that on the slide here. Generally, they're not included in the definition of what a legal entity customer is, but there is an exception. I think it's important to draw that out. For statutory trust, they would be considered and covered by the new CDD rule. So that's statutory trust. Otherwise, trusts are outside of the ambit of the new CDD rule. The CDD, also importantly with respect to trust, the CDD rule does not supersede your existing obligations or practices regarding trust. So important. In terms of CIP and other components of your AML program, this does not supersede that. It just sort of breaks down who would be beholden to the new CDD rule versus what type of trust would not be. So we're concerned for our purposes in the immediate term with statutory trust. And then fi finally, financial institutions under the CIP rules still need to take those additional steps to verify the identity of a customer that is not an individual. So the important point here is it's not a brand new approach to CIP. All of those requirements with, re with respect to customer identification are still there. We're just sort of adding on top of that a few different layers to ensure from the government's perspective and from regulators perspective that we're doing everything we can to make sure we're capturing information about beneficial owners. And from FinCEN's perspective, that is the real area of weakness in terms of how do we stop money laundering and where is a lot of the new era of money laundering come from? A lot of it is coming from the difficulty in finding out who are our beneficial owners. So next slide, let's talk a little bit about beneficial ownership identification and verification. So the key components here are we've got increased requirements now for documenting our beneficial owners. So the threshold number here is 25%. If an individual has 25% or more equity interest in the entity for which the, the entity that is now becoming a customer, they would qualify as a beneficial owner. So that means you can have up to four potentially beneficial owners for any legal entity customer. That's important for a couple reasons. If there is not somebody with 25% equity in your customer, then what do we do? We get that question all the time. Well, there's a second prong to this identification notion on best beneficial owners. We have the ownership prong, but then we have the controlling prong. 
So if we do not have somebody with a 25% interest in our customer who is about to be vetted through our CBD system, we are responsible for finding somebody or identifying somebody that has control. And control is typically somebody with an officer's perspective, somebody who has a management role, a high level management role. And so the important thing from FinCEN's perspective here is they want you to come up with someone. Now, one other caveat to that, even if there is a beneficial owner or two or three or four, you still need to identify a control person. So both prongs apply irrespective of the situation. But if you don't have a beneficial owner, it's very, very important that you identify somebody who is in a controlling situation for that customer. Um, and I just, as a side, I wanted to add here, FinCEN does have a form for collecting information on beneficial owners. It's actually really helpful. It's on their site and we can help you all get access to that. It's, it's on the FinCEN site under the CDD um, rule link. You'll see there's actually a form. It's intended to guide you. You do not have to use that to collect informa information on beneficial owners, but I will tell you from my own perspective, having viewed that and used it with some of my clients, it's very helpful to get started at least. And then you can decide how you want to tweak it depending on the nature of your institution. So with respect to that 25% equity, let's talk about a few things. Um, you are responsible starting May 11th, 2018 for identifying and verifying any indirect or indirect owners with that interest. And many excluded entities for which no look through is required are pointed out in the rule. So those who are registered with government regulatory agencies, charities, and some other highly regulated institutions are not included as part of this rule. So there's a carve out for that. Uh, also, we talked about trust earlier, but trustee is not considered a beneficial owner if the trust owns 25% or more of the legal entity. So the trustee would not be considered a beneficial owner if the trust owns 25% or more. But even if no one meets the 25% ownership level, as I just said, we still have to get that control person. So I wanna emphasize that. Next slide. Okay, in terms of understanding the nature and purpose of the customer relationship, this is that risk profile part that so many of you are familiar with. Part of doing business in your sector is that we need to know our customer, KYC. We need to have a customer identification program. And importantly now, the government is emphasizing this idea of a risk profile. And the profile is the type of thing that will stay in the books with your institution. And you will be responsible, as we'll see on the next slide, for monitoring that profile and then updating it accordingly when there are changes, suspicious activity, anything that might require you or counsel you to adjust the profile. So again, understanding the nature, um, we want to include self-evident information, of course, that we would normally include in a CIP situation about the customer, the type of account, the service or the product basic customer information about income, net worth, occupation. And we get questions about risk ratings. So that's not a requirement here. I have found, and I think my colleagues around the table, we may talk to this a little bit later during the hypothetical, have found that having a risk score can be very helpful for your own internal organizational purposes. It is not a requirement, but it's something that may be advisable depending on how you do your monitoring of your customers. So finally, on slide seven, ongoing monitoring, and I, I sort of tease this up at the <clears> beginning <throat> of the introductory slides because I think this is the area, and again, FinCEN has said this, where they're expecting the most questions, they're expecting the most concern. When they were taking comments on the rule, there was a lot of comment commentary about what do we do with respect to monitoring the situation with our beneficial owners. So just a qu couple quick tips here and reassurances to get you started. And again, we'll talk, talk a little bit more about this during the hypothetical. So um, now, importantly, customer information includes beneficial ownership information. And the risk profile may, but is not required, as you'll see on the slide, to be integrated into an automated monitoring system. So some of you are already operating with an automated monitoring system. Some of you may not be. Um, again, in terms of best practices, if it's a system that's efficient and is working currently for your CIP program, it's probably a great idea to fold in your beneficial owners into that system so it's part of the automatic monitoring. But it's not a requirement, and we've seen plenty of financial institutions that are doing it other ways, too. It doesn't have to be automated. 
We'll talk a little bit about that also during the hypothetical. When a financial institution detects information about the customer that is relevant to reassessing the customer's risk, as I mentioned, it then must investigate or conduct an inquiry and update that information. This is the part I think that more likely than not, you all have experienced by reading FinCEN guidance and enforcement matters where the government does tend to pick on financial institutions. Are they updating their client list really? Well, they've memorialized that now. And it is a responsibility under the new CDD rule to be monitoring that risk profile. And so a couple of different ways to do this. There can be somebody from the money laundering compliance group who is assigned to the monitoring function. There's the automated monitoring piece we talked about. But the important takeaway here is that you are now responsible for monitoring this risk profile. And so the other thing they talk about, and then we'll, we'll move into the next, next sector of this discussion, is updates to beneficial ownership being event-driven. They use that term event-driven, meaning that is there a change in the dynamic with the customer? So for example, all of a sudden there's a big withdrawal or they've involved a foreign institution in terms of money transfer. Something that would typically alert your compliance team that, that it's different, unique, it's raising some type of yellow or red flag. That's the type of thing that FinCEN is looking for in terms of updating the beneficial ownership um, uh, uh, profile. So we wanna be looking for those things at all times. And then finally, um, you know, FinCEN makes this point, I think it's an important one, you know, we should be monitoring anyway. So we should take a risk-based approach to our monitoring and we should apply that, of course, now to the beneficial ownership clients and customers. But this is something we should also be doing with, with respect to all of our customers. It is part and parcel of what is expected now from the government. And I think this memorialization just makes it all the more important going forward. So that's a lot of information in a relatively short amount of time. I don't know, Dan, if we have any questions. We have questions. And so I haven't invited the audience, but I am now inviting the audience to please come. Um, you can send us your questions and we'll answer them. Uh, we do have one question, which is, does the beneficial ownership need to be updated on a periodic basis via attestation or can it be done once and triggering events? So good question. I'll go ahead and take the first stab at it. They say at the station. So yeah, so, um, so as you know, some financial institutions get at the stations ah, from the clients gotcha. as, uh, initially. Yes. And so the question is whether that has to be updated as part of, of their uh, monitoring um, program. Understood. So our read of this is that it's the latter, right? So the, the updates should be happening. They should be event driven and risk based. And so that makes that monitoring component even the more important because you will, your compliance team, your compliance officer, will be picking up these little um, ebbs and flows with respect to beneficial owners. And the responsibility, once we see some sort of diversion from what we're, we're the typical um, type of business we're doing with that customer happens, that, that's when we're responsible for making that type of adjustment. Agreed. Anything to add, Weege? No, I think that sounds right. I would just also keep your eyes open to other types of risks. Obviously, they're event driven, but there can be some events that might be even outside of the account itself. Um, you know, if on any of your media monitoring, a client were to pop up or, you know, somehow information gets back to the bank, perhaps through other transactions, other clients through, you know, some of your own people um, in various parts of the world. Um, that also would require, I think, you know, an updating of the customer profile. It can't be just so static that you wait for a triggering account event. I think any of these type of compliance regimes are more dynamic. They're not really tick box. And it's also up to you at some level where there are obvious risks, obvious changes to, you know, look into that and kick the tires a bit. And then we, we, we got a question on if we can give an example on what we mean by monitoring or risk profile of customers tied to monitoring tools. So, yes, great question. And, and this is, as I mentioned earlier, the area that is of most concern and was most commented on during the culling of the rule. 
And so um, monitoring will take all shapes and forms. And not to hedge my response here, because I'm, I'm sure you want something very specific. And unfortunately, I don't know the exact manner of your business and how you're currently doing monitoring. But in terms of best practices, those financial institutions that are conducting this on an automated basis, it's a matter of folding this notion of information gained from beneficial owners into the automation and then conducting the monitoring like you would typically under your customer identification program. So if you're doing that already on an automated basis, you would just be folding this new information and treating beneficial owners like they're part of the CIP program. That that's your easiest win. If you don't have automation, then really what you're doing is, what, what some of our clients have asked is, should I just assign somebody or should I train somebody to understand this rule, follow the expectations of the government, and then have a person designated specifically for that task? I think that's your other best option here. If you don't have the luxury of automation, then have somebody who is trained on beneficial ownership on the rule, knows and understands what the requirements are, and can be that go-to person on monitoring the relationship going forward. John, would a Easy example of using automation in this context, be adding beneficial owners, they're part of the customer profile now, they're tied into the automation, for example, on the specially designated sanctions list. So as that updates itself as part of your internal process, you know, it's just, it just does it automatically and will flag if somebody who is listed ends up on, on the SDN list. Is that Absolutely, agree 100%. That's a really great way to do that. And, and would you raise another really good, important point? So as part of our vetting of beneficial owners, we should already be doing those trade right. looks already and those sanctions looks and those SDN looks. Those are one of the triggering events that might change the mm -hmm. profile such that we would be taking a different look at that owner. It's a really good point. Yeah, and Jonathan, I suppose politically exposed persons and there's automated things that will kick up, right? I'm thinking of like Reuters World Check, various things like that. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, the regulators would certainly expect there to be the, that automation in place because, you know, it's been available for a long time now. It's, it, it's, it, it's considered, you know, uh, a practice that's, that's really necessary. And for, for politically exposed persons, um, <clears throat> certainly, you know, having, uh, having those automated processes in place uh, is, is very important. Um, and, and, you know, as well as, and, and just to kind of take up a point that, that, that Widge made about events even outside the, the account itself, um, you know, sometimes it's even geopolitical um, events because if, you know, certain countries, um, you know, start going a certain direction politically and, and, and start getting closer. And, and in our region, we've certainly seen it, countries that um, would, would traditionally maybe not have any contact with you know, certain uh, certain activities in in the Middle East right. or in in, in Asia, um, you know, because of be, because of their political uh, direction, are now are now fomenting those those contacts and 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 strengthening them. And so so you know so, something that you might not have seen five years ago now because of geopolitical events, now this country is is very very close to you know a given Asian country or a given uh, a Middle Eastern country where other events are taking place. So, so it's it's just important to keep keep an eye on on the on the um, uh, geopolitical front as well. And that's that's the part that I think you know really can't be done by automation yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you know, the, obviously some of the a lot of the lower level stuff yeah, that has to be automated because there's not there's not enough brain power to uh, to, to keep track of it all. But but these are these are the higher level issues that I think we you know we definitely have to at at, at the level of everyone um, you know listening here on on this uh, on this webinar that's that's I think where the real value uh, that that we bring to, uh, to to these to these issues is as as um you know as, as as the leaders of these these areas. So that's one of the questions. Um, are the institutions required to retain third? <clears throat> party providers for this monitoring? I guess the answer here is no, they're not required, but several of them do engage. And so the question on the other hand is, are they entitled to rely? And I guess the answer is yes, you may rely. You obviously have to do your due diligence on them and make sure that they have the proper, um, they're sophisticated enough to provide the information as, as expected. But you also need to make sure 
that they are tuned or that you are tuned to these changes and that they are added to whatever system is being used. Right? That's right. Well, I, I think the point is that, um, you know, the fact of, of relying on a third party, um, you know, can, can be can be fine. It's just it's a management decision. But it doesn't it doesn't really um, take away the responsibility of the financial institution any more than you know hiring a, a an agent to go and get a government contract um, you know absolves us of of any of any responsibility with respect to to corruption issues. So it it, it really does have to be a um, uh, you know an issue an issue. Yes, we're relying on third parties, but that's that's not really um, the end of the question. That that's just a resource issue. And I and I know that you know lots of um, financial institutions in in Latin America um, have you know have made the decision to have these uh, issues you know dealt with in house because <clears throat> because of the the different labor market um, and you know having a third party doing it. Um, because of labor market issues in other places um, is is fine, but the, the, the same level of responsibility applies. That's a great point. Quite literally, the buck stops with the financial institution. Right. And we, we have some additional interesting questions, very specific. So what are our thoughts on industry direction on going lower <clears throat> than 25% for higher risk customers? So great question. Uh, wow. You guys are really digging in. These are the exact type of questions that we're hearing on a regular basis. So, again, not hedging at all here. It, a lot of this depends on the type of financial institution. If it's a highly regulated on the top end in terms of regulatory requirements, uh, on the top end in terms of risk, then I think absolutely those are the type of institutions that will be doing that sort of thing. Now, the lower risk, it becomes a risk profile type issue. What is our risk profile? Do we need to do we need to actually implement this type of system that would be looking at beneficial ownerships below 25%? And what the guidance I've seen thus far and the commentary is, you know, use your best judgment. Is the system currently working? If the system is currently working in terms of AML compliance, there's really no reason to go beneath or go above and beyond the requirements and the rule. If there have been problems and issues, if it's a if it's a financial institution with a lot of suspicious activity, it's just part of the nature. It's not a bad idea at all to maybe lower the bar to like a 20% or a 15% threshold. Yes, it makes the work more challenging. Certainly, maybe it's about adding an additional resource to your compliance team, but the safety component, the reassurance there, I think makes it probably worth it. And John, if we look at customer due diligence and KYC, you know, more holistically, right? I mean, you can't just hide behind the 25%. And if you're aware, for example, just to use a, you know, absurdly simple example again, if you're aware that somebody is trafficking in illegal arms and they own 10% of a customer, you can't say, oh, well, it's 25, it doesn't trigger, I'm not adding them to the profile, I'm not taking additional steps with respect to that account. Great point, and, and which that goes back to that, that dovetails with what we said earlier, Danny, which is to say that irrespective of all of these new this new rule, you're still responsible for doing that type of damage control from the beginning and making sure that your compliance program is covering those types of threats and risk, irrespective of this 25% number. So really good point. Sounds good. So we have another specific question. Are customers listed in the US OTC pink sheets considered well regulated? Customers in the U.S. with OTC, the OTC pink sheets considered well regulated, in, in so they're so not like it would be in the charities type of box uh, or, or basket. Um, is that that that's that's the question, right? I think that's that's what the question is. You know, whether it would be whether it would be in, would, in, within the exception if it's o, right. OTC pink sheet. That's right. Whether those do not have to be considered as monitored as part of the new rule. Like as the entity who's required to do right, correct. So yes, so if we're talking about charity type organizations, they would fall outside of the requirement of the rule. Again, I come back to holistically when you're talking about the OTC pink sheets. Obviously, there are a lot of fine, good companies who are listed on the OTC pink sheets. It's also the area where 
you know, the pump and dump companies come from, where you've got the shell companies waiting for reverse mergers. So it kind of gets back to the notion of holistic um, CDD and KYC as well, I think. Right. So they, so they, I think as a, as a group, the OT, you know, those listed on the OTC pink sheets would not, we would not put them in the category of you know, the charities that would be, in, that would be the, the exception to the, to the rule. Right. Fair point. Okay. Understood. Yeah, I completely agree. Right. And it does come back to, as which mentions to that sort of holistic notion of ensuring that your risk is appropriate given your profile and things like that. And so it will depend again on the type of entity. <clears throat> yes. And we're getting a lot of questions uh, <laughs> regarding trusts. Um, okay. So if there is a trust among the owners of a company, does the client need to disclose the beneficiaries of the trust? Um, so in terms of the new rule, go ahead, Jonathan. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, John. I was going to say, in terms of the new rule, of course, um, trusts are not included in the definition of legal entity customer, so they would be fall outside of the scope from a customer perspective. Is there a second part to that? Or? No. Okay. And I'm going to apologize to the audience that we are receiving a lot of questions. <laughs> Bear with us. That's good. And we'll just wild. I think, in. John, and the same thing that comes back to again, right? Holistic customer due diligence KYC. Because I know from the government standpoint, a bank is going to have an unhappy day if it was aware that, you know, one of the owners of the trust or one of the beneficiaries of the trust, but it didn't quite trigger, you know, the, the, under this customer due diligence rule, but that there is a red flag there. Great point. Doesn't doesn't change your CIP responsibilities. And of course, we made the point earlier just to reinforce that statutory trusts, of course, are included here. So I mean, the question didn't seem like mm -hmm. it drew a distinction there, but we just want to be very clear that statutory trust would be included as, under right. the rule. Yeah. Right. So, and there's probably a whole area of, you know, what's considered a trust in foreign jurisdictions. And mm -hmm. is it a fideicomiso in, in, in Mexico? Um, you know, what is it? Does that does that qualify as a as a as a as an exception um, as well? And it, and it probably depends on the facts and circumstances because um, I, I I would I, I don't think that there's a per se list yet. You know, as we do as we have in the tax um, world. Uh, you know, as as far as what uh, what's considered a trust for for purposes of this exception um, overseas, that would have to be a case by case determination right and we keep getting questions on trusts. Trust. yeah so um, what if a trust is 25% owner and there is an, another question whether it's asking for um, a comp uh, an entity that is owned for, by four trusts um, what items would you request and in addition to that what happens if some beneficiaries are minors Good question. So for if it's a statutory trust that owns 25% or more, then as we mentioned earlier, the trustee would be considered a beneficial owner. And in that case, you would be beholden to all of these same rules with respect to that beneficial owner and vetting them accordingly. Jonathan. Oh, so sorry. I thought you were about to say something. And so the second part of that regarding minors was, would you, sorry, Danny, would you repeat? So what what information would you be requiring for minors which yeah so the rule itself doesn't speak right. necessarily to minors i think it's a great question it's not the first time i've heard that question and it does sort of go back to the mean we've talked about here which is judging the the amount of risk here and then doing the appropriate due diligence based on the risk here but the rule itself to give you a reassurance around that does not speak specifically to what would be required for a minor, and I think they're talking about a minor trustee. A beneficiary. A minor beneficiary, right. So the issue, the question at the end of the day in terms of best practices, if I were doing this myself and trying to make a decision what to do with respect to a minor in that circumstance, I would judge the risk based on the circumstances. If it quali the minor qualified as a beneficial owner, I, from a best practice perspective, would just go ahead and treat it like that and follow the rules here and get the information I needed to under my CIP put them into the system and monitor accordingly. But the, unfortunately, the rule itself doesn't speak specifically to minors. It's a great question, though. Mm -hmm. Agreed. 
And what if a trust owns a legal entity that is not exempt from the rule? Would the trustee be the beneficial owner and control person? Okay, so a trust owns a legal entity that is not exempt from the rule. So it's a legal entity that would qualify. As a customer for, that's regulated, right? Yeah. So in that circumstance, again, I think we go back to the core rule here, which is if it's a statutory trust and there, and that statutory trust owns, uh, has a uh, trustee, owns, sorry, owns 25% or more of the legal entity, then the trustee would be considered a beneficial owner for vetting purposes. So um, sort of back to the basic rule on that. And, and, and the trust itself, if if there were if there are um, four trusts and each is 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 a, a you know beneficial owner of twenty five percent of of the you know non accept the non accepted, non -accepted legal entity, legal right? entity yeah. then the then the trusts have to be reported as beneficial owners. You don't you don't have to go back up above the trust because you have the because you have the the, the exception. The, the trusts are, are generally an exception. Right. So, but you would have to report the trust themselves as beneficial owners in a statutory trust situation. Right. Yeah. But looking at this, and perhaps it comes from my jaundiced law enforcement background, but also uh -huh. looking at this, I mean, these are one hand, a lot of times these rules are, you know, you might not have had to put that down because it flowed through a trust. And that's a great defense if you're defending yourself in front <clears throat> of the regulator. But just as a matter of pure compliance, I would put them down. Uh, you know, that covers the bank, it covers you, um, generally no harm at all to the, you know, to the corporation or the people behind it that you're putting down. So in these kind of tough calls, gray zones, just assume that the rules apply. I think from a best practice perspective, that's really advisable. And it's the issue, I know the questions, a lot of the trust questions are because of the resourcing. And now, what do we need to do about trust? And do we need to fold this into our program now? And, and as we're just saying, it's, it is a matter of best practices and making sure that we're covering the risk. And if a regulator were to look at this and there was potential risk there, we would have covered ourselves properly by having done what we need to do on beneficial ownership there. So Agreed. it's a good call. So we have two different lines of questions that are coming up. Um, and so I'm going to move away from trust because we're running out of time. Um, but one question that I've, I've been getting in different forms, but it seems to be the same question is, what if the um, beneficial owner is a highly regulated entity in a foreign country? Um, will they still be? Great question. So if the um, legal entity is highly regulated, the guidance says that that can be a consideration in doing a risk analysis as to whether or not that entity would qualify as a beneficial owner. And so the, that's an internal risk analysis. Now, our theme here clearly has been in terms of best practices to err on the side of caution. So even though it's highly regulated in a foreign country, if we're talking about the UK, it's certainly gonna be a lot different than for example, Indonesia. And I'm not just picking on countries, that's just the regulatory differences. The UK, extremely highly regulated on AML. Indonesia, not so much. So using judgment and risk-based profiling there, Certainly on the Indonesia side, you would want to take every precaution and treat it like it's a legal entity that falls under the ambit of the rule. On the UK side, you could use your, according to the commentary from FinCEN, you would use your risk-based approach to making a determination as to whether or not it would qualify. And again, I think that's a case-by-case -case basis, even if it does come from a highly regulated country. That's a good one. And the next line of questioning come, comes to what is a new account that triggers the requirement? So if a legal entity customer renews their CD or loan, is this considered to be a new account? And if so, are the banks expected to obtain certification forms when those customers typically do not physically come to the bank? Um, can they mail certification forms? Can they trust on that? And this question comes again and again in different hypotheticals where there is an existing client opening a different account with the same institution. 
does the whole analysis apply again? It's an existing client. Yeah. So we do have the we do have the monitoring that that's you know that now has to take place uh, on a, on a regular basis. So uh, you know we're 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 no longer uh, kind of you know j just tied to when an account is is open. I mean, that's that's kind of one of the new things. That's the, you know it it um, in 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 Mexico we just we just had uh, some new regulations in in, in December uh, that came online with re with regard to constant uh, monitoring in in uh, in this space uh, AML space. Um, so so I think I think to, to a certain degree that question is maybe not as important as it as as it would have been before these these rules. But but John, you were you were gonna. I was just going to agree completely. This does fall into the monitoring bucket right now. So now we've got an amended <clears> risk <throat> profile because it's there's a whole new bucket of um, things going into the, um, the the relationship with that particular client. And because of that, it triggers that monitoring flag that would then go up. You would then look to see if the profile had changed in any fashion. If it had, you would be responsible under the new rules for doing the due diligence that you would be required of a new beneficial owner. So digging in to find out if there are any new beneficial owners, even though it's an existing client. Yeah, even though their CD was a, you know, five year or whatever, and, and now it's, you know, they want to continue same amount, same term, all, all that. This is, you know, this is still, it would still, it would still, you know, bring up the, the monitoring flag, so to speak. And so the one of the questions that comes up is, do you have to require the certificate of beneficial ownership at that point? The specifics of that certificate that you usually require when an account is first open? Good question. So the, the commentary doesn't speak directly to that. If this occurs after May 11th, 2018, in the manner that you have presented this really good hypothetical, by the way, these are really good because these are the exact type of questions that um, most folks sitting in your position are concerned with. But if, it, if that occurred in the manner you just represented after May 11th, 2018, then my answer based on my understanding of the rule in the commentary would be yes. Yeah, I think that that would be the best approach to take, uh, the most conservative. And, and even and even though it, it, there is also a case by case basis, and at certain points, if they just opened the account a few months ago and they're opening a different account a few months later, and it's a very close customer that you know, perhaps they're necessary, but. Um, in the side of caution, again, if it's a close customer, what is the problem in getting another certificate from the customer? It shouldn't be an issue. That's good. And it goes back, so, you know, which made the point earlier that if the regulator were to come in and look at that situation, what would they be looking for? Would they probably be looking for to see that you've covered your bases with respect to that new account and did what needed to be done if it occurred after May 11, 2018? Nice and so another question that is a difficult one, but I'm going to put ourselves on the spot. And that's fine because a lot of these issues are are, cover, are covering, you know, what what our hypothetical uh, is designed to to, to bring right. out as well. So yeah, the good news. These are great. Uh, these are great questions. Yes. So here is while funds are exempt, is there any indication of an expectation that firms are still collecting UBO information on foreign ownership? For example, be funds owned but not controlled by non by non U.S. investors. So my experience has been yes, that you would typically be collecting that information in terms of the confines of the rule. Again, not a direct speak to that particular situation, but what I am advising my client in that circumstance is absolutely to collect that information from a best practices perspective, particularly given the foreign component to that. And what would be expected again with our experience, our collective experience dealing with U.S. regulators, what would be expected in that circumstance if, if that transaction were to be vetted, the expectation would be that that information was collected. Great. And I think I've covered uh, the <laughs> topics in the several questions that we received. And I apologize if I missed one. Please send it again if I haven't re you know, answered. Um, one just question. wanted to throw one more thing out there before we move on um, in terms of what I've heard a lot from the regulators, and this may be more towards the larger financial institutions, but that's the use of your own data. 
as part of monitoring, not just individual customer, but for example, if you're seeing suspicious transactions in one particular industry or one particular geographical area, to get back to Jonathan's point about geopolitical risks, they're expecting you to essentially um, learn from that data and do some tire kicking on a risk-based basis into other areas. I mean, that's something that um, you know we've heard quite a bit about from the UK regulators and also a you know, for publicly held institutions, the SEC has now, you know, made that part of their guidance is using your own data in a in a compliance setting. That's a great point. Yep. All the more important about we talked about monitoring and having your yep. systems that supply that type of data. So I think that's a really great sort of cap on how important it is to make sure that we're doing the proper things internally to use our data, acknowledge when there are suspicious types of activities. And if you have that, like which says, if you have that capability, you are a leg up in terms of what expectations would be. And another question is how is the best way to um, catalog the client exemption what type of information do you need a certificate from like the to document it to, to, do memorialize. How to document yes so a client that would be exempt from the rule and the question here is what do we want to show if we had to demonstrate for example to a regulator that the client that that particular client was exempt and i think again all of you or most of you who are in the financial institution industry and are working in that capacity are familiar with the CIP program. And so certain information will automatically be collected as part of your standardized CIP program already. The indications thus far, and this is all subject to amendment, like everything we're talking about, because we're expecting a lot more guidance after May 2018 on this, but the information thus far is that if you're following the standards required of FinCEN in terms of CIP, you will have the information you need on an entity that's not necessarily covered under the rule. That's enough for, to show and demonstrate that this is not a qualifying entity. And talking about CIP, um, if a legal entity is owned by another legal entity that has more than 25% ownership, are banks expected to obtain CIP on the individuals that are part of that legal entity? So, so kind of another step up That's beyond right. the, so, so does it, you know, how far up the, the tree is it, does it go just beyond the one, the one step in the, in the tree? It's not, I think, I think that's the, think that's, that's the question. That, that's the question. So the rule currently says, and again, subject to amendment, I would be willing to bet that this scenario, once it starts to play itself out in real time, will alter the approach right now because it's not been flushed out in the regulations. But the rule as of right now is it's just that first degree, right? So if you do get into a second degree situation from a best practices perspective, as which has been saying throughout, probably a good idea to do a deeper dive. And we've got lots of resources in our deck that you all have access to. Where we talk about doing a deeper dive on these types of entities in terms of what the rule specifically says. It is not requiring that yet. Will this be flushed out? Will it look different maybe a year from now than it does now because of this exact scenario. Sounds like the type of scenario, right, which we will see people trying to get around the rule. Mm -hmm. right. And so we're going to see FinCEN and other regulators eventually catch up to that. And there'll probably be some sort of amendment put in there. I, this is all hypothetical at this point. But in the meantime, from a best practice perspective, doing additional, a little bit of additional CIP homework on what's happening to the second degree entity is not a bad idea from your own perspective so that you're covering the question and the issues that might come to you from a regulator if there's trouble down the road with respect to the first degree customer. Yeah, especially if it, yeah, but it's fairly, you know, obvious from a first look that, um, you know, that, that this has been designed to, uh, you know, somehow screen ownership, beneficial ownership, or ultimate ultimate ownership. Great, another great question. Yeah. And so a more specific hypothetical. Commercial loan process typically involves a deposit account open days or weeks prior to a loan closing. Is the expectation that a new form would be collected for the loan closing if they are two weeks apart? Or is there the ability to take a risk-based approach to new <coughs> accounts within 30, 60, etc. days 
to not collect another form. So there is another a lot of uh, uh, focus on the certificate beneficial ownership. Yeah. And when are they actually expected to require a new certificate from an existing client? So can you treat that as, as a single event, basically, I think yes. is the, the question, which is, it, it, you know, it, it's opening that account, that requisite account is really part of the loan process mm -hmm. itself you know can that be treated as a single a, a single event so well I, I don't know that you'll love my answer to that i think what i would do given the current guidance on this is i would treat those as separate events and again if you're in the process or have established this vetting um, procedure it shouldn't be that big of a haul to do this I know it's it's an additional burden and ideally we'd all like to treat those as sort of a single event but the the strict reading in the four corners of the regulation as it currently sits would probably counsel you to do treat them as separate events which agreed agreed yeah I think we're on the same page so I think we cover the questions that are outstanding now and we i was going to ask we each to talk about the information that is available um out there and what what would be expected uh how far would a, a search for information have to go if there is some news out there about one beneficial woman that's one of the most difficult questions to answer is the when do I stop? Very hard in any context. Um, I think you can stop when you have reasonably assured yourself that you know there aren't any problems or you have found a problem and that in and of itself may be dispositive as you report it up. Um, you know, you don't have to run down every rabbit hole that comes about, um, and it's really just a matter of judgment. If you think, you know, and I'll ask everybody to jump in and, and disagree with me, but in my oversimplistic way, I kind of boil this down to when you're talking about customer due diligence and KYC or the onboarding process, it's who is this person or who is this corporation? And that rolls out into the beneficial owners and you know, other people who might be behind it, nested accounts, all those various things you hear quite a bit about. Where does the money come from? And, uh, you know, what are they doing with the money? What kind of transactions are they entering into? Um, so as you look at that, uh, we talked about a number of areas, SDN lists, politically exposed persons, um, you know, various databases that you can use. But as you begin to ferret some of these various issues out, I mean, one of the places to not forget is just plain old Google. Um, and, you know, one of the tricks in addition to just plain old Google is using a uh, local language Google, which is an amazing resource, completely flips the uh, type of information you're receiving. And Jonathan, you probably have good experience using local language Google. Right. And, and it's, it, you know, it, it is important to, you know, make sure that we are, um, covering local language, I've, I've seen reports from you know some of these third party, uh, you know some of these third parties that 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 you know, do do searches, and you know for searches that are that are conducted on a on a Mexican um, uh, individual or, or or customer, and all they cover is English language uh, media, and that's just that's just not sufficient. Um, so, you know, obviously we need to be, we need to be checking for that sort of thing. Um, one thing that's important, and, and this is, this is true for, for, for Mexico, we don't have time, uh, you know, for a brief history even of, of, uh, uh, freedom of information in, in Mexico, but it's something that's happening all over Latin America and people who have been gone from the region, even a, a couple of years, um, are, are surprised by how much information is available from uh, especially from government sources um, in, in Mexico and, and throughout Latin America. Um, so, uh, you know, very, very important to, to, to keep up to date and, and on top of the, uh, the information that's, that's available. I mean, other areas to look and, you know, we have it on the screen, but don't forget social media. Um, 
private investigators have databases that you can also buy. And what they really are, are just a conglomeration of, as Jonathan mentioned, many of the uh, publicly available databases. Like, for example, you all know this better than I do, but I recall from uh, years back that Florida has most everything you've ever done on a database. If you've gotten a loan to buy a boat, if there's a building. I mean, Florida is one of the most fleshed out government databases that's available. And there are software packages that put them together from the various states and different countries. And essentially anything that's publicly available on a person can be at your, at your desktop. Um, looking at the websites, you know, as you do your searches into government agencies, as you look for, and, and some of these software packages will pull them, judgments, bankruptcy filings, all these just sort of various things. And these are often, you know, you may come up with not much, but often they're little strings to pull. And I suppose when you pull the string, I mean, even if you see a red flag, and I guess, you know, Danny, you had alluded to this. And I think the example you used was a negative press report. You need to get behind that a little bit. That's not the end of the inquiry, especially when you're talking about press outside the United States, but also in the United States. I mean, what is, where did that press report come from? I mean, is it a blog spot that is, you know, I hate Bob Jones, if that's the person whom you're vetting at the moment? Um, you know, what is the, per who are the people behind that? You're looking for, is it a legitimate publication? Is it a legitimate journalist? Even if it is a legitimate publication, a legitimate journalist, is it based on, you know, factors that somebody has a beef against this person and it might just might not be true. Um, and then I think ultimately don't forget when you've gathered your information that one of the great sources is the customer themselves to come back, ask follow up questions, see what they might have to say about these various uh, things you're finding and those are additional strings to pull. Absolutely. Sounds good. I think we're at our time. Um, I wanted to thank the audience, thank the panelists. I see several questions popped up at the end, and uh, one of them was a request for the FinCEN form that you mentioned. We will uh, make sure we send uh, the, the form, the link to the form, uh, to everybody that participated. Uh, the other question that I saw came up. Uh, a few times at the end here um, was about uh, renewal of uh, loans and renewal CDs and the again the certificate of beneficial ownership. Um, we I think our our contacts are available. Please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be happy to discuss informally with you our thoughts on on any questions that came up at the end that we were unable to. Um, address. Thanks again for um, attending, and we hope to be with you soon. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thanks.